Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Hi. I'm just going to give everyone a minute to kind of trickle in, um, and then we'll get started shortly. All right, welcome everyone to the final installation of this kind of um, season, as I like to call it, of Research Unbound. Today we're going to be talking about COVID-19 and its impacts on women-led enterprises in Pakistan. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our great panelists today, starting off with Mizba Hamid. She's an independent researcher and PhD scholar at the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics and is currently pursuing her research at the University of Basel in Switzerland, as well as Barbara Langley, who some of you may know, she is the current director of the Center for Women's Economic Empowerment at SITE. She built the program as we know it today from the ground up and has a strong breadth of expertise on this topic. So we're really lucky to have her with us today. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, Isma, if you want to go ahead and get started with your presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. First of all, as you introduced, I am Mispa Hamid and I'm an independent consultant and researcher. I got this opportunity to work with SAIP last year on the damage need assessment of women-led enterprises amid uh, COVID-19 in Pakistan. Actually, uh, of course, COVID-19 affected all the sectors in economy, but the women-led enterprises were the most vulnerable one due to the many reasons. Um, and my, our research was about this uh, very topic. For instance, the firms run by women, uh, women are mostly exposed to challenges like uh, lack of, uh, you can say, the lack of finances and then um, uncertainty and, and finances to maintain the cash flow solvency applying and receiving government support during the pandemic and uh, the ever increasing and changing uh, demands of customers and decline of orders and different stuff. So this study is an effort to highlight the problem faced by women-led enterprises, as I said, it consists of lack of financial cushion to sustain the business activity, applying and receiving government support, deficiency of opportunity to raise capital, to introduce new product lines during the changing um, consumer demands, surviving through government stringency measures to combat the pandemic, absence of provision for marginalized segment in government policies, greater dependence on local demand, facing more difficulties in newly created circumstances which uh, COVID-19 has introduced and high level of resistance from regularity authorities on doing businesses. So actually, the key barrier which was being faced by women-led enterprises, are, of course, these are a uh, few uh, which, uh, barriers which I explained, but the main uh, reason why the women-led enterprises could not perform well during COVID-19 um, which we will explain further and uh, that how our research um, came out and how the uh, what outcomes we found in Pakistan. So uh, the main area of research was these um, uh, immediate impact of COVID-19, which is uh, which survey results shows that when the government introduced measures to combat uh, COVID-19, like uh, the restrictive hours of working hours and whether it is a fully locked down or selected lockdown, other SOPs which uh, firms has to follow, for instance, if it is operational for alternative days or fully uh, 
stopped working or working on only weekends. These kind of measures, which were the first introduced by government uh, in uh, 2019 when uh, COVID hit. So um, when uh, we went to the uh, field and surveyed about this topic and we were surprised with the result that, of course, we first we divided uh, our sample in different categories. We took uh, the sample of 107 enterprises including men-led enterprises and women-led enterprises to check comparatively the results. Further, we further categorized into formal and informal uh, enterprises. The formal were those which were associated with any kind of government bodies or public uh, entities, or they are paying tax, uh, they, uh, they are tax filer in, uh, in short words. And informal are those which are private kind of uh, enterprises, which are not affiliated with any government entities and they are not tax filers. Further, our, uh, the sample was, um, distributed between all the provinces of Pakistan, including the administrative states like Azad Kashmir and GB, and uh, of course the federal uh, Islamabad. And besides, we further, uh, we further extend our uh, research area by taking few key informant uh, interviews from the government officials, from SMEDA, uh, the uh, main organization which is working for uh, small and medium uh, enterprises, Women Chamber of Congresses, and then uh, SBP and FBI in different uh, organizations in Pakistan. So the our first result uh, regarding uh, firms functionality and their operational operationality during the COVID-19 was turned out that the formal uh, and women-led formal firms, formal enterprises are less fully functional as compared to the informal one. The reasons were very obvious because of formal uh, enterprises were affiliated with government entities and they are registered in government or the chamber of commerce or anything and they they have a check uh, government has a check and balance on these whereas the informal firms were mostly the home based or anything like that and they are more on the private sector side so they were operational during the covid-19 and uh, if you can see that uh, the result shows that firms uh, uh, the formal firms which were fully operational was only 35% where is the informal were quite high in number. Besides uh, the other uh, thing that uh, we came to know about the change in sales and change in cost. Of course, during COVID-19, the sale and cost both were highly affected. The cost of production was suddenly increased and the sale of course declined by many customers or due to the many reasons for for instance the, even if we see in the market the stores were closed due to the COVID-19 measures and um, the reason why women-led enterprises are mostly affected by uh, this uh, lake in sales and high in cost because they has relatively less social contacts, low level of market integration and comparatively less option to innovate. Innovate in the sense that the consumer demands were highly changed during COVID-19. People were mostly uh, turned towards, uh, you can say the e-commerce as compared to physically going to the markets and buy the stuff. The further, uh, Mayors uh, by firm, which uh, the further uh, mayors and firm time type uh, that our result shows that the product diversification in women led enterprises are relatively very low as compared to men led. As I said, the reasons were very obvious. Similarly, why the loan from the bank or microfinance organizations are very limited when it comes to women-led as compared to men-led. The reason was that, that the women-led organization mostly are risk averse. They were not of the view that, uh, as interviews showed, they, they were not uh, of the view that uh, is there any certainty if they get the loan and was able to return it due to the sale, whereas men were quite a uh, risk taker in this sense. Besides, of course, the formal sector are more, uh, you can say, eligible for the bank loans and microfinance, uh, bank loans or microfinance loans as compared to informal sector. Similarly, the other thing that uh, we noticed was the, uh, you can say the staff layoff, uh, they had to cut on the wages of 
on their staff or they have to file few staff uh, members due to the restricted sales due to the decline of orders or postponing of orders and increasing cost of production they had to uh, you can say the cut down on their uh, staff and their wages and um, of course they were unable to meet the shifting or changing consumer demands and raising capitals and as i say the declining or, uh, orders and postponing orders you can say further uh, why people are reluctant to get government um, support was women-led organization, as I said, were risk averse and they were not of the view that they should take a um, loan from the bank, which has a huge number of interest rate. They uh, prefer to use their own savings or getting loans from their near ones uh, so that they don't have to go to the government sectors or the banks or for uh, returning in interest rates or any legality because they are not legal in terms of being uh, function functional. So if you can see uh, from the chart that um, how government support, how much government support ex uh, got by the firm, then um, surprisingly the IT and ICT sector, which were we, we were hoped thought that it would be able to get more uh, government support as compared to other because of, of course, because they were related to the education sector. You can say they're more skilled and more educated and more well-informed, but they turn out to be less informed. And the reason they did not uh, go for the government support was that the government always asked for something, uh, some asset or property as deposit or air security in, in against the loan. And the asset they acquired was not recognized by the banks. So they were unable to get um, direct loans from the banks or the microfinance uh, sectors. Besides leather and um, you can say the textile uh, firms, they they were uh, you can say they were better in condition because um, they got government support in other ways too. For instance, the government of Pakistan announced uh, utility bills relaxations, tax relaxation, tax rebate for textile and construction firms, which helped them very well as compared to the other sector, which were unable to get any relaxation in these things. And especially the cottage and handicraft industries or the private services, they were mostly <laughs> attacked by the high utility bills, high rental bills, uh, even when they were uh, not functional in their offices, they had to pay the bills and the rents, uh, which were very, uh, you can say, a huge toll on their businesses. Uh, further, uh, like you can see in the chart that um, these from, um, from textile sector and the leather sectors, uh, and uh, you can say retail sectors, they, of, although all sectors are unable to get a huge uh, government support but these sectors were one of them and the lack of information if you can see that there is a 58 percent retail sec uh, sector in private sectors you can see the 58 percent of these sector were totally uninformed about any sort of um, support that government is uh, you can say the government is providing or any sort of easy loans or um, any uh, sort of, you can say, support uh, that was available. Besides, another reason why people were reluctant to get the support was the long and cumbersome process. Mostly the loan application were online and the businesses which were in um, market before pandemic was not very much well informed with the online system, the e-banking, uh, e-commerce and other stuff. So it was really a high uh, deal for them to apply online and of course lack of knowledge that what were the conditions and how would they return it. Um, besides, uh, you can see um, we have already discussed this uh, that um, pre pandemic and after pandemic effect. So, uh, of course, uh, if we compare women led and men led organizations, women led were always not very, you can see, not very uh, well performed even before the pandemic. Even pre pandemic, they were vulnerable in one way or other. But the pandemic effect 
women led enterprises more badly as compared to men led organizations because of course the reason is obvious they were not the one who are um, receiver of or recipients of uh, government support utility bills even a simple uh, small portion you can say bills or rents these are something which they were uh, unable to meet because of the size of firms and the you can say innovations or changing demand of consumers and lack of information, lack of e-commerce skills, lack of trainings, lack of mentorship, lack of networking, and lack of market integration as compared to the men-led organizations. So further we can see, uh, we further uh, investigate about the cross-border trade. Women-led enterprises are mostly are uh, those who were ex on exporter side size side as compared to the importer one. The if you can see from the results, then ICT and IT are top firm performers in uh, <laughs> uh, in international uh, trade. So of course, um, during the pandemic, uh, the most of the enterprises were of the view that they faced postponing of orders, they face declining of orders, which were a great toll on their uh, small size already vulnerable uh, firms, and they had to shut down because of unable to meet the demands of consumers or the sales which were useless for in the inventory or sales which were declined and they are useless for them in their stores. So and the most important thing uh, which we came across during our survey is the adoption of e-commerce across the sectors. So e-commerce was, of course, it was there before pandemic, but it, but it was a kind of upsurge during the pandemic because um, the local firms, the women-led organizations, they were not involved in the online processes, online sales purchases, or they have lack, uh, limited knowledge about e-commerce. So of course, ICT and retail uh, services, you can see they involved in uh, e-commerce in one way or other, but the cottage and handicraft or these kind of, especially the rural firms, informal and rural area firms, they have no knowledge about how to function um, the online uh, sales purchase or what is e-commerce in general. Of course, uh, Samida is an um, organization which work for the medium and small enterprises in Pakistan. It worked very hard for women-led enterprises to educate them or skill them with e-commerce uh, workshops and uh, other uh, courses, but it was really uh, expensive for small and medium uh, enterprises and they were unable to attain it. Besides, it was not accessible to the rural or informal enterprises because of, of course, they are not registered and other legal uh, reasons. So next, uh, the last question that uh, we asked uh, the enterprises about and during our survey was about the vaccination. And it was surprising uh, to know that the women-led uh, organization were more adoptive to vaccination or other SOPs as compared to the men-led organizations. And the reason was very obvious uh, that uh, they were, of course, most risk averse. Besides, they are not willing that the government official with them in any way or uh, we can't say harass them or uh, we can say that uh, to involve them in some legal issues or something they always wanted to be on the safer side so it was better to apply SOPs rather than um, deal with these kind of issues. Besides uh, the men-led organizations turned out to be very uh, you can say blunt or very uh, brave to deal with these things. So uh, of course in private sectors um, and, IT and ICTs were the most important and most um, large, num they were in large number to accept the um, vaccination and other SOPs of COVID-19. What lesson learned during our um, survey and the outcomes that we received is that the most important thing for for, uh, for women-led organizations in Pakistan was to switch to e-commerce by training women, for instance, digital trans, uh, transfers and international shippings 
it should be uh, on um, through uh, e-commerce and of course they are um, very much involved in it now uh, but they, there is a huge scope of work in this field second thing the self employment is um, it turned out to be a great uh, you know, entrepreneurship you can say during the covid that pakistan seen the bloggers vloggers online trainers freelancer for the very first time during covid 19 it was not a culture in pakistan before of course and there were only one to two person who were involved in these uh, online um, services but it became a new normal during the COVID-19 and people are, especially the stay-at-home women, the stay-at-home mothers or other uh, educated skilled women who were unable to go outside and do uh, normal jobs, they, are, they have uh, conveniently become the bloggers and bloggers or trainers or freelancers and they are earning very good amount in return of many services. Besides, uh, the best thing is that there are a number of applications which were um, introduced during uh, COVID-19 like Mocha or the Gharpar. These are the services from uh, some sort of, you can say, a formal organizations which give, uh, which, uh, where you can easily hire any person for your home-based services, whether it's beauty services or home uh, domestic chores or anything. It was new thing in Pakistan. Besides uh, product diversification is something uh, that worked, uh, that um, women led organizations of course work very hard on this because the demand of uh, consumers have already changed during COVID-19. Besides, um, the most important lesson that we learned that we should uh, work on relying on our self-sufficient resources for our sustenance. For instance, the resources that women already have, they had to, they should utilize it more betterly as compared to uh, generating uh, capital or financing from somewhere else's. Besides um, being creative and innovative and forwarding the contract, that is something that I'm very much interested in. It's not necessary that they have to work everything on their own. They can work in a team, in a supply chain that they can switch from intermediate to the final good production or distribution, or they can forward the contract from one women led to the other organization. It would make the things more easy for them and generate more employment for all of them. Besides the results and before forward, um, as you can say, the from the results that we discussed, that the cost of doing business increases significantly, especially for the women-led and formal uh, with, uh, formal enterprises. So, in terms of sales, the informal sector and firms situated in rural areas are at high risk. Of course, uh, as we explained already, that uh, informal sector and rural area are the most vulnerable because of lack of government support, lack of knowledge, and of course, the fear of being uh, involved in some legal, uh, legal uh, legality or other um, issues. Further, the share of women-led enterprise to access government support is lower than it's for men-led enterprises. We have already discussed the reasons. So the next result that we show uh, that we uh, came to know about uh, that is the measures taken by the firms to deal with pandemic are not found equally impactful because the government measures are some measures are had adverse effect on their firms. For instance, they were unable to accept all the restrictions because of accepting all the restriction or restriction applying all the restrictions may lead to the fully shutdown of their firm. So they selectively accepted few SOPs and work on them. The next uh, access of government support is very limited and mostly provided to the formal firms only like the relaxation in utility bills or the tax rebate or the tax deduction. It, it, it's for specific firms like textile and construction and other and uh, the other uh, the handicrafts or the small scale uh, industries uh, firms are they were not recipient of any kind of these relaxations or easy loans. So performance difference also based on gender of owner and province from which they work. Of course, uh, uh, 
more, for instance, and the large uh, or more, you can say, educated or more opportunistic uh, provinces have more opportunity as compared to the less developed provinces. For instance, if you see uh, from the result that the um, Punjab based uh, women uh, enterprises and KPK based uh, enterprises are the more, uh, you can say the, sur the their survival level is very high as compared to the um, other sectors like uh, Sindh or uh, AJK or uh, GB. Further, the government policies to support the business sector are generally in nature, not special for you can say marginalized segment. And vaccine intake is considerably low among men-led enterprises as compared to the women-led enterprises we already discussed the, the reasons. And uh, finally, the providing internet access, particularly in rural areas is something I totally endorse because they need to work on it. They need to have uh, some sort of, um, workshops or networking or mentorship to make them learn how to do e-commerce, how to do online sale purchase. We need to empower these rural areas and informal sectors which are unable to get access to these uh, workshops. And of course, uh, last thing, the user-friendly mobile apps like I discussed the Mocha and Gerper and other uh, that had already in, um, market right now, but there's a huge scope of these other um, mobile friendly application for those early stage businesses and e-learners. And thank you. That's all from me. Any questions from your side? Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, we already have a few questions coming in, but if there are any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and then we can transition over to Barb if with any um, commentary and some more background in expanding the story of this research. Great. Thanks so much, Tamari. Um, and a big thank you to you and to Adam and Mikra and all my colleagues um, at SIPE's PPL department for the opportunity to work together and shedding light on this important issue. I'm also really extremely grateful to Ms. Bahamid and the hard work she's put into researching the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on women-led enterprises in Pakistan. Um, I personally feel really passionate about this issue, um, particularly considering how the pandemic has left markets upside down. Um, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. My grandparents owned and operated a garage and used car, car dealership. Um, my dad, um, in a time when his job was going a little bit crazy, started um, a, his own business, a roofing company. Um, my brother runs currently his own residential and commercial electrical business. Um, and even the women in my family, my sister-in-law is a florist and focuses on arrangements for weddings and other life celebrations. Um, and my niece now has started her first entrepreneurial journey, a flower farm that supplies beautiful fresh flowers to florists um, and vendors across my hometown in, in Pennsylvania. So I've witnessed firsthand how the trials and tribulations of the market have impacted business um, within my family and particularly for my brother and my sister-in-law who weathered the COVID-19 pandemic um, with their businesses and, and looking at the lockdowns. Uh, and, and the, the, the social distancing orders here in the United States. Um, we talk about COVID-19 in some ways being the great equalizer, but as Mizba has mentioned in her remarks, we all know very well by now that the experiences across the globe in dealing with the pandemic have been anything but equal. Um, at, at SIPE Center for Women, Women's Economic Empowerment, or CWE as we're more commonly known, um, we've been tracking the data on women-led enterprises and women in the workforce more broadly. And I can tell you that the story is very similar no matter where you go. Um, even here in the United States, we've witnessed greater gr job losses and business closures among women than men. Um, and it's largely because women often dominate those sectors most impacted by the pandemic, such as hotels, restaurants, and retail. Um, women also have faced um, an increase in the burden of care of children and elderly relatives during the pandemic. The U.S. jobs report has been glaring. Um, in particular, I remember that back in December of 2020, women accounted for all of the total job loss in the country, 
um, with women accounting for about 55% of the net jobs lost since the start of the pandemic. That's here in the United States. Um, McKinsey reports that one in four women are considering leaving the workforce or downshifting their careers versus one in five men. And as we further break down this group here in the United States, we're seeing three major groups that have experienced some of the largest challenges. Those that are mothers that are balancing their careers, um, women in senior management positions and black women. And so when we were talking about doing this, this uh, webinar together, I, I thought that I would try to paint a picture of the story behind the data um, that MISBA is sharing. Stories from SIPES partners across the globe that have um, bared witness to very similar challenges that MISBA has laid out for us. Um, keep in mind that many of the barriers that women face in business have been exacerbated by the pandemic. So for example, domestic abuse and violence and harassment in the workplace or online has been a plague in our societies since prior to 2020, but is now actually coined a shadow pandemic resulting from COVID-19 by the UN. Lockdown orders across the globe often have left women at home with domestic abusers and subjected women business owners transitioning to e-commerce to online gender-based harassment. Partners within the site network reported that women that may still have a job to go to in this environment have been manipulated with the false hope of keeping their job in return of sexual favors. And we've had site partners also report that women entrepreneurs that have transitioned to e-commerce have now been harassed through hate speech, body shaming, and, and other harassment um, issues as they're posting videos and photos to promote their um, to promote and showcase their products, such as clothing collections, um, as they're posting those on social media and other e-commerce platforms. And this hostile environment um, has really damaging consequences for businesswomen, diminishing their zeal to access social media and digital platforms um, to operate their business um, and impacting their ability to become economically independent. Um, in fact, I think one of the most horrific conversations that I've had in the last two years um, was early on in the crisis with our partners in Papua New Guinea. Um, many of you know how difficult it can be to be a woman there and to have a voice in the laws and regulations that govern you and your businesses. Um, domestic abuse in that country is off the charts, while representation and bodies of power is actually very, very low. Um, I found myself on a call with a group of women business leaders, including a president of a chamber of commerce. She had personally bore witness to police violently breaking up a fruit and vegetable market run by women in the informal sector. These women had to risk violating the country's lockdown order because it was the only way for them to earn money and to support themselves and their families. The police came and made an example of them. They destroyed their vending tables, they burned their crops, and they beat the women very badly. And these are women in the informal sector. Chambers of commerce typically do not represent them. However, on this day they did, and within 24 hours, the coalition that I was speaking to on my call organized and raised the issue with the Ministry of Police and some other political leaders. They were able to establish the country's first police brutality hotline, which I understand is a huge accomplishment as publicly discussing police brutality in this country had previously been taboo. And so the, this coalition is changing the culture of accountability within the country's political sector. Um, elsewhere, we at C, we are seeing other women raise their voices as, as well. Um, at the end of 2020, SIPE reached out to women business owners in Eurasia, for example, and asked them to submit essays that capture the stories behind the data that is similar to MISPA's report. And I was particularly struck by a quote from Ida uh, Dusipova, a restaurateur from the Kyrgyz Republic. She stated that, and I want to quote um, in entirety, she quoted, um, and this too shall pass, I told one of my crying employees. My employee is a single mother of four kids who is trembling like a leaf because all of the uncertainty around COVID-19. I put all of my efforts into sounding very calm, although down very deep inside, I was just as scared as she was because the stakes were so high and honestly, my business was about to fall. From the Women's Business Council of the Philippines, site partner Mylene Abiva highlighted that the compounding challenges for women, stating that during the financial crisis, the Asia financial crisis several years ago, we didn't really feel the effects of the crisis differently from men. 
because it wasn't really gender based under unlike during this COVID crisis where we feel that a lot of the burden is now on women because we don't we not only need to lead our businesses but we also are taking care of our families and managing our household finances in a way that we didn't have to do before. But as, as markets adjust to these new realities, we do find some areas of encouragement. Research is showing that women have turned to entrepreneurship during the pandemic for a variety of reasons, likely a combination of needing flexible work hours, gaining control over personal finances, financial imperatives or job security, um, and for many of you on the call today, I know that you are our are, are site partners and, and site staff. And so you know that we at site believe that for women entrepreneurs to thrive, we need to really focus on building that strong enabling environment or ecosystem. Um, we often talk about this at site as looking at it as a holistic approach based on three levels of entrepreneurial communities. First, we talk about the individual level um, fostering an entrepreneurial mindset, leadership development and empowerment. And then as that individual grows in their entrepreneurial boots, so to speak, they become part of a larger community and their voices are elevated as community leaders. Here, it's important that we're working with them to build um, linkages, um, linking community actors and developing and creating collaborative spaces. And then further as they mature, we're helping them to unite with one voice um, to promote entrepreneur friendly policies, lower those barriers and garner community and official support. And I think this final stage really is key as it serves as a foundation to then bring in and encourage more women entrepreneurs and ensure that a cyclical process continues to feed that ecosystem. And so advocacy is, is one of the, the sort of hallmarks of, of site programs, as you all well know, and whether aimed at public policy, public opinion, or both, it helps to marginalize, it helps marginalize segments of the population like women um, to make their voices heard and making possible more just laws, institutions, and social norms, and to really um, put some action behind some of those recommendations that NISBA has included in her, her report. Um, and so through this, um, many of you well know, we use the women's business agenda um, as a more formal process. Um, certainly it can take uh, place in various forms, um, uh, but we've seen a lot of success in, the, in this advocacy work and particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic and, and within this environment. Um, SIPE has witnessed coalitions in countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, and Nigeria transform the way economic stimulus economic stimulus packages have been handled, ensuring that governments are keeping the unique needs of women business owners in mind as they're developing their recovery strategies. The coalition um, in Papua New Guinea that I mentioned earlier um, came together with SIPE to complete a business agenda and advocate on behalf of women business owners in the country. And really, this is democracy in its truest form. Think about it. A business constituency takes an active role in removing barriers to this to their success, and they pave the way for a proactive partnership in building economies and societies that are inclusive and prosperous for all citizens. Um, as we look at the numbers again, the McKinsey Global Institute's report on the power of parity, how advancing women's equality can add $12 trillion to global growth reminds us that gender inequality is not just a pressing moral and social issue, but it's also a critical economic challenge. If women who account for half the world's working age population do not achieve their full economic potential, the global economy will continue to suffer. So I'm so grateful again to share the stage here today with MISBA and the PPL team. This data is incredibly important to consider and it, it just, uh, compounds the, 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 the uh, research and, and stories that we're hearing from across the globe as we continue to um, look at this economic recovery journey together. Um, and while the statistics might vary from country to country and, and some things may differ, I think as you dig into the stories of the women business owner, I think you'll find that the experience in this pandemic can be very similar in, in many ways. Um, and so we're, we're ready to help. Um, CW has a number of free resources uh, to work with you and your teams, um, your partners, um, and have a number of free resources available on our website as well. Um, and so, uh, Tamari, I think I'll leave it at that, and, and maybe we can have some good discussion going forward. Thanks so much.
Great. Thank you so much, Barb. That was very interesting, very sobering, but also very um, inspiring to see how women are coming together or overcoming these obstacles. Um, I know when it comes to women-led businesses or women entrepreneurs, oftentimes they can be in the informal sector, which is a bit more difficult to gather some data and information on. Um, Isma, did you have any, or for both of you, has that been your experience? And what lessons have you taken away from gathering data um, on these groups that may be a little harder to reach? Um, of course, it was, uh... It was one of the biggest challenges, especially in the informal and rural areas. And the uh, uh, lesson we learned is that we should go, we should not go directly to them, because uh, the decline level was almost ninety percent when we approached them. But then we decided to go through the proper channel from the Nazim of the city, the head of the city, or the market chief, and then they recommend us to go to them, and they were willing to uh, inter uh, to uh, interview or respond to our answers. But still, the decline level was almost forty percent. So the first lesson we learned is that we should go to the head of the city or the uh, chief of the market space so that they would be willing to in, uh, to get interviewed because they thought that we are from some income tax or the government sector to ch have check and balance on them and they were reluctant to answer any question and even they are they were reluctant to let us in so um, yeah we overcome this challenge by going through the proper ch channel yeah And Tamara, I think that I would add, I mean, it, it definitely is a hard uh, not to crack, so to speak. Um, but I think in SIPE's experience, we've typically worked more at that level of entrepreneurship where you have established entrepreneurs that are ready to scale businesses up. Um, but particularly with this pandemic and with the contacts and networks that we have, we found that there is um, sort of some... Um, cross programming that can be done or, or um, cross assistance in some ways, particularly with the Solidarity Center, which is one of our um, uh, sister organizations under the National Endowment for Democracy umbrella. They often too target this informal sector of, of women in business and, and assistance for them. So uh, it is you know something important that I think that we have to continue to think about and, and, and look at, but I think that there are ways you know, through some of our networks to, to really expand our, our um, uh, assistance. Great, thank you. Um, and looking at, you know, the informal sector, it makes me think of a case study that was done by CUE about the Somali Chamber of Commerce and how one of the big recommendations there was creating a more informal cooperative to kind of uplift the voices because, you know, as you've said before, maybe these chambers of commerce are not really representing the informal sector. They're not really, um, you know, providing that advocacy. And so do you think that this could also be an option in Pakistan? How have you seen this kind of play out? And is this a recommendation that you think would be applicable or more generalizable to other regions? Uh, so uh, first, uh, can you please repeat because there were distortion in your voice, maybe. And uh, little did I understand from your question is, of course, there is a, you can say there's a huge room in Pakistan to apply, uh, to apply this sort of thing because of course women chamber of commerce are not representative of informal sector and of course even the rural sector because the um, because of course the first thing that is the scareness you can say or they were afraid of being um, uh, being in light of the legal issues like uh, they were of the views of the people from the government sector or from even in, in the police officers if they visit them they can harass them in one way or other not in a specific way but in terms of bribes or make them scare uh, 
because they are not legal and they are not formal, they are not tax filers, so they try to get bribes from them. So in uh, that way, they were always reluctant to give any kind of information. But of course, if there is some organization which are representative of informal sectors or the less developed rural area sector, then it would be very helpful for them. And of course, for the researchers like us, because we would be able to know where to target them, where to go, that, how to, go directly to them instead of um, because in the work effort was doubled when we go directly to them by our person contacts. But of course, if there is some uh, organization like that, which deals with them with them and which help them in um, integrating or anything that it would be helpful for them and for us either. Yep. And tomorrow, I think I would just add, I mean, I, you know, Ms. Ba said it perfectly. I mean, there's, there's strengths and strength in numbers, right? So, um, you know, anytime that we can help uh, organize a group or, you know, of these informal traders and former women in business, um, getting them into some sort of collective, getting them talking about issues that impact them um, that are similar from one to the next, um, finding ways to put a strategy together to advocate for that, I think is great. And I think that we've seen um, elsewhere in Africa, how uh, these sort of cooperatives have come together, for example, to um, do very sort of small community loans um, to help women business own, uh, owners get a leg up and get started and, and get moving on, on there. So there's, there's a number of reasons why these types of collectives can, can really impact and be um, positive in, in what they do. Thank you, and I apologize for any technical issues on my end. Um, I am seeing a hand raised within the um, chat. Unfortunately, we cannot call on you, so please put any questions that you have in the chat or the Q&A. But building on that kind of concept of coming together, one question that we have is, after receiving support from the chambers and or associations, did any of the informal enterprises elect to formalize? Have you seen that? before in your work? Uh, not exactly. Yeah, not exactly. Yeah, because uh, first the informal enterprises were the one who were the, who, who did not, you can say, uh, got any support from uh, chamber up till now. But if uh, they get, uh, if they receive support from associations or chambers, course would they they would be able to you can say of course elect to formalize of course but right now it's the it's totally opposite of the situation that we are uh, looking for yeah and, and I question, oh, yeah sorry sorry you, you no miss but that's okay finish your thought you could you continue continue please <laughs> I was just going to add um, um uh, I see the question in the chat from Adam and I'm assuming what you mean is um, whether or not the informal businesses elected to become registered formal businesses themselves, as opposed to informal enterprises like organizing a formal coalition or, or, or something like that. Um, and it would be interesting to, to dig a little bit deeper, Adam. I don't um, know necessarily uh, from the context in Papua New Guinea, the example that I was raising in my remarks, um, if that has happened there. I imagine that that is probably starting to happen because the coalition in Papua New Guinea also works hand in hand with SIPE's uh, Women's Business Resource Center, which is helping um, women gain entrepreneurial skills, gain business skills, understand the legalities of business um, and to help them sort of uh, get into the market and, and scale their businesses up. So I imagine that there are likely those that have now gotten that support from the resource center um, to be able to register their business, but there's so many things that are involved in that. Um, so honestly, I'd have to go back and, and talk with our colleagues there to, to see if we have any examples that we can share. So that might be the, the next uh, research tomorrow. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, I wanted to touch back on the microfinance or access to capital that we've discussed, because I know that microfinance generally women and women led enterprise enterprises are the number one 
um, customer, I guess, of microfinance or microcredit loans, um, which it seems is not the case in Pakistan because of the risk aversion. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate on why you think that might be. And also um, Hannah's question, which is how can we encourage women to take risks and gain access to this finance to grow their businesses? Um, yes, um, that's very true. First, and of course, uh, the suggestion that was given that uh, they should be, uh, uh, they should receive some sort of uh, support from chambers or any sort of association. So they would be encouraged to get registered or they would be uh, educated enough to take risk or go to some uh, dimensions or some sort of uh, places they are reluctant to go. Because of course, uh, there are no proper networking, no proper mentorship, no proper trainings or workshops for them. Informal sectors, of course, they are trying hard to uh, work on these stuff. I'm not talking about the rural sector. I'm talking specifically about the informal sector, which are trying to uh, educate themselves, to um, train themselves so that they would be able to get registered because a lack of uh, finance is the main reason they are unable to register themselves. It requires some sort of, uh, in fact, uh, money. And most importantly, uh, they have to work really hard to get registered. It's a very longer and tiresome process. That's why women who are in informal sector, they are uh, going with the flow that we would work on it, The how long it, uh, it takes, it's fine. But when it becomes necessary, then we will go and register ourselves. These are the firms who are aware of the process of registration and um, becoming formal. But there are some other uh, 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 enterprises and businesses who are unaware of the process and they are even unaware that they're actually the entrepreneur or they are doing business because for them, uh, it's like a likelihood. They have no idea about what they are doing. But when we approach them and ask them about their business and set up because in, uh, in there was one question that why the layoff is very, uh, the di difference is very low between men and women led organization. So I put this thing here because the micro and small um, enterprises are the one which are ha having only one or two employees because they have only two workers and they are unable to um, kick them off one or two at, uh, at that point. Similarly, the um, the enterprises which are very small in number and they have very restricted uh, finances and support and of course information they are unable to get formal or get registered but the, with the proper training with the proper mentorship they would definitely uh, go to the for uh, go for registration and get all the perks that our formal uh, enterprises are getting especially they would be able to apply for the loans which should be of course and there there is no restriction of informal sector to get loans from the uh, microfinances or in the banks but they were reluctant because of their own personal fears which we discussed with them so uh, it's not like that that uh, the government has uh, some sort of of restriction on them. Besides for the biggest loans, of course, they require some sort of asset or some sort of security or some sort of documentation, which is um, which they uh, were unable to access. But for the small loans, for the microfinancing, it's quite obvious that they would they are eligible to apply for them. But they are reluctant because of this reason. And of course, because of the interest rate that they are um, risk averse that we, were, we will not be able to recover the main cost and uh, able to pay back with the interest rate. That's why they are reluctant. Oh. Sorry. No, that's fine. And, and um, Tamari, I'm humbled actually because we have some heavy hitters um, as attendees here today. Salima Ahmed from BWCCI and Azia Khan, um, I see are very active in the chat and they um, both I know uh, through partnership with Siphon you know, through their own um, initiatives have been working on access to credit, microfinance things and, and what have you. So I would encourage them also to put more ideas in the chat for us. Um, but I, what I will say, um, you know, from a perspective elsewhere in the world is, um, you know, microfinance can be a very risky thing as we all know. Um, I remember a trip to Jordan that I had um, that was probably maybe three years ago, four years ago, it was definitely pre-pandemic. Um, 
but I remember one of the big issues that I was talking about with the Women Chambers of Commerce there at the time was this issue of microfinance um, and the fact that somehow there was some quirky thing going on in Jordan where there were loopholes that essentially allowed male relatives of women to take out a microfinance loan in their name with the understanding that there would be a business or something started from that loan, but it was used for a very different purpose. It wasn't paid back, and it was actually the women that were put in jail for not um, paying back their loans. So, you know, the risk um, we can all imagine, but some, you know, sort of are shocking uh, to say the least. And so I think it's, you know, ultimately really important that we look at these coalitions, whether it be of informal, um, women business owners uh, or women's chambers of commerce to look at the enabling environment and look at these mechanisms that are out there and ensure that the um, setup and the regulations and, and what have you is done in a way that um, is easy under to understand is, you know, as loophole free as it can be and, 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 and really educate women about what it means um, to, to take this on. Um, so hopefully that's helpful too. Thank you so much. This really is a topic that we could talk about forever because there are so many nuances and so many different areas of discussion, but to just wrap it up and try to wrap it on a positive note. Um, in a lot of ways, the pandemic has been very devastating, but has it also created any opportunities um, to innovate or to help women break down some of the traditional barriers and establish themselves more firmly in the post-pandemic economy? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry Tamari, your voice were distorted. Can you please, maybe some issue with my internet or something, can you please repeat your question? Can you sure, hear me? Of course. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Kindly uh, repeat the question. There was distortion yes. in, it, uh, in your picture too. <laughs> so my apologies with that. Um, my internet or maybe yours. I don't know. Um, if I stop my video, maybe that will make the audio better. Um, yep. Just to say. You know, the pandemic, as we've discussed over the course of the last hour, has created a lot of barriers for women, but has it also created any opportunities for them to break down the traditional barriers and establish themselves more firmly in the post-pandemic economy? Yes, 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 of course. Uh, it was actually uh, very interesting to know their views about post-pandemic when we asked them about what they see and then where they see themselves after one quarter post pandemic and uh, of course if you see the results then may, uh, half of them were of the view that they would of course not uh, go to the same condition as pre pandemic but they would be able to revive to the current condition after uh, pandemic uh, barriers and after restrictions and measures were taken off of course um, because uh, in uh, with the results that we seen uh, we were of the view that uh, the pandemic not only caused them to shut down or get lower on the sales or businesses, but of course it creates lots of opportunities for them. For those women who were not in this sector, for instance, as I said, the freelancers and the uh, home-based uh, trainers or other uh, uh, stuff like I discussed earlier, they were the women who were not involved in any kind of businesses before, but the pandemic helped them to rise from them and helped them to create their own vlogs or on their channels and they're earning very well. Besides the women who were uneducated or unskilled about these things, they learned somehow or they hired few, uh, you can say, implies who are very well skilled in e-commerce and they started businesses online. Even the established organizations, uh, businesses like, if you can see the Aga Noor or other uh, biggest names of uh, Pakistani brands, they started, uh, they, of course their business were somehow um, online before the pandemic too. But after, after pandemic and during pandemic, it was very well established due to the online businesses. And people still prefer even after in the mayor 
standards are lifted and SOPs are lifted, now the general population and con consumers and customers are are very much uh, you can say comfortable with the online businesses so it's a very good opportunity for the women led enterprises to work on their online skills or in their e-commerce side so uh, of course um, not only there were barriers but there were some opportunities for women led businesses in pakistan during pandemic and after pandemic and um, it's interesting to know that few women-led enterprises, they worked really better. Even before the pandemic, they were not very well off uh, for uh, who are self-sustained or who are using their own resources. They worked very well during pandemic and they are still working very well. But of course, the major number was were those who were vulnerable and who performed very poorly or who were completely shut down due to the adverse effects of pandemic. And of course, the every uh, other women-led uh, organization were in search of finances or capital to generate so that their cash flow uncertainty become uh, minimized or they revive from their, the, you can say the crisis they are coming through. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. That's great and, and well said, Ms. But I don't I don't necessarily have a, a whole lot to add to Mari to this, but certainly um, you know, while there's been challenges, um horrific challenges in, in many cases, um, as I mentioned, there there really are a number of opportunities that has uh opened up and a lot of women that we see in our in our uh partnerships around the world have turned to entrepreneurship, have um, open new businesses have changed their changed their businesses to a different um, uh, sector that is 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 in high demand because of the pandemic, for example. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately, I feel like you know, with the shift um, and sort of rapid sort of transition to the e-commerce uh, level, it's it's really allowing a level of flexibility that many didn't have necessarily before. So you know, while there's some some growing pains that, that, that we're going through right now. I, I am very hopeful um, about how we will pull through all of this um, and how uh, women entrepreneurs and women business owners will come out on the, the other end of, of economic recovery. Thank you so much for those very insightful responses. And thank you for participating in our webinar. I really have learned so much over the course of the last hour. Um, and thank you so much to our um, attendees for the great comments in the chat. It's really an insightful discussion. So take a look if you haven't already. Um, and then my colleague Adam is going to put the evaluation link in the chat. Please fill that out if you don't mind. I read every single response and consider them for future events. And for more information on our upcoming events, please go to our new website. The link will also be in the chat. Um, and you know, you can view our events there. You can sign up for our newsletter to get updates and stay up to date on PPL. Thank you so much, everyone, um, and have a lovely rest of your day. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Tamari. Thanks so much, Ms. Ba. Thanks so much. Thank you.